A Muslim man claiming to have a bomb took a rabbi and three other Jews hostage on Saturday at a synagogue in Texas. Fortunately, the standoff ended with all of the hostages safe and only the attacker dead after law enforcement stormed the building. There are many lessons to learn from this incident, but the liberal establishment wants us to learn one lesson above all others. That is the urgent need to fight Islamophobia. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to The Michael Knowles Show. I'm Michael Knowles. My favorite comment from Friday is from Virtual Nomad, who says, does the PR for Biden think that allowing Kamala some airtime will make Biden's awful approval ratings seem less concerning? Yes, it does. I know you, you, you probably intended that as a joke, but yes, that is the theory. <laughs> the theory is that Joe Biden is not very popular. He doesn't seem very with it. He doesn't seem like a great president, but he has a vice president who is much less likable than he is. And there have been a number of presidents throughout history who have used this theory, but that, that's certainly the case. The greatest argument against impeaching Joe Biden is Kamala Harris. You know, that's in a, in a presidency that has so many downsides, that's one upside that the president can count on. When you want an upside amid such crazy turmoil, I would strongly recommend you check out Get Upside. Are you spending too much money on gas? If you live in America right now, yes, chances are you are probably spending a little more money than you'd like to be on gas. Well, what if I told you that you can save 25 cents per gallon? You get cash back 25 cents for every single gallon that you use to fill up with Get Upside. It's a free app. You download it. What would you say if I told you that? You'd probably say, Michael, you're a liar. Well, actually, in fairness, I haven't told you the whole story because, because you can actually save 50 cents per gallon on your first fill up. If you use code Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, go to Get Upside right now, get the free Get Upside app. For every gallon of gas that you buy, you will get 25 cents per gallon cash back. And on your first fill up, it will be 50 cents per gallon cash back. Super easy to get the money. Goes right into your bank account or you can use PayPal or an Amazon gift card, however you want to do it. There's no catch, only cash back. Go to Get Upside right now. You download that free app, use promo code Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, save 50 cents per gallon. On your first fill up, you will get that cash back code Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S. You know how much I hate to say I told you so. You know how much I hate to be right in my guesses and predictions and suspicions. But I knew when I saw this story trend and it said hostages taken at a synagogue in Texas, I knew that the guy taking the hostages was not a white guy. I knew it. (laughs) I knew it. I knew he wasn't a Christian nationalist or a white supremacist. I knew, I knew it. I knew he wasn't a white guy at all. I knew he wasn't a Christian at all. Do you know how I knew? Because they didn't specify in the headlines. This is known as Coulter's Law, named after Ann Coulter. Ann Coulter's Law is that the longer it takes the news media to identify a mass shooter in the United States, you can broaden that out to attacker, terrorist, or whatever you like, the less likely it is to be a white male. And that was the case here. I was looking at all of the headlines. It said, uh, attacker comes. Okay, attacker. What kind? Okay. If it had been a white guy or a Christian or a Trump supporter or any politically incorrect category, you would have seen that right there in the headlines. So I'm looking and I can't find any details about this guy. Finally, I see British National takes hostages at the set, I said a British national, huh? Uh, something tells me this isn't Lord Ingleberry or something. Something tells me for, because they're doing whatever they can to hide the politically incorrect fact that this was a Muslim guy. And so I look and what's the name? Malik Faisal Akram. Okay, Malik Faisal Akram doesn't sound like a Methodist, doesn't sound like a Presbyterian, but they won't because of the threat of Islamophobia, which we'll get to in a second. The FBI then is interviewed after this attack. Fortunately, it has a happy ending. The hostages are released. No one's hurt other than the guy who was committing the attack. 
The FBI is asked, okay, what motivated this attack? They, they shrug their shoulders. They say, we have no idea what could have motivated this attack on the synagogue. We do believe from our engagement with this subject that he was singularly focused on one issue uh, and it was not specifically related to the Jewish community, uh, but we're continuing to work to find motive and, and we will continue on that path. In terms of the resolution of the incident, uh, the, the hostage taker is deceased. Okay, singularly focused on one issue, but we're not going to tell you what that issue is and don't worry, it's not related to the Jews and anyway, let's just move on. Well, hold on, you know what the issue is. You're saying this attacker, was sing- he had this one single focus, but take our word for it. We, the FBI, we would never mislead you. <laughs> we, the FBI, don't want it to, what's, so let's just do a little Google search. What, what is the issue? Okay, the issue is that, that this attacker wanted to free Aifia Siddiqui, who is currently serving an 86-year sentence for attempting to kill U.S. troops and FBI officers. Siddiqui is an Al-Qaeda terrorist. Not only a terrorist, but specifically associated with Al-Qaeda. But this is not related to the Jews, right? You can take our, except, hold on, Siddiqui, during her trial for the terrorism, she dismissed her legal defense team because she said that the lawyers were Jews. And she demanded, that she demanded, I kid you not, that the jurors in the trial take DNA tests to prove that they were not themselves Jews, because that would be unfair if they were to judge her. Uh, she said, quote, it is this cruel, ungrateful backstabbing of the Jews that has caused them to be mercilessly expelled from wherever they gain strength. This is why Holocausts, in quote, keep happening to them repeatedly if they would only learn to be grateful and change their behavior. And then after her conviction for the terrorism, she said, this is a verdict coming from Israel and not America. That's where the anger belongs. So I'm no forensic investigator. Okay, I'm no... I, I'm not an FBI officer. I think this might have something to do with the Jews. It might specifically, but we we just don't know. How can we know? There just aren't enough. Joe Biden said this. Joe Biden was asked about the attack. He said, we just don't have enough facts. Do you know why he targeted that specific Well, no, I don't. We we don't have, I, I don't think there is sufficient information to know about uh, why he target that synagogue, why he insisted on the release of someone who's been in prison for over uh, 10 years, why he was engaged, why he was uh, using anti-Semitic and anti-Israeli comments. Uh, We we just don't have enough facts. We just don't know. I mean, he told us his reasoning and the terrorist that he was trying to free told us her reasoning. And it was pretty clear But we just got to wait a little longer just to get all the facts. This is Joe Biden, who you will recall, accused Kyle Rittenhouse of being a white supremacist in a campaign ad. Kyle Rittenhouse, just based on a little video of him shooting what we now know to be his attackers, his white attackers, by the way, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, Joe Biden says he's a white supremacist. He says this is an example of white supremacy. He didn't wait for the facts to come out in that case. Kyle Rittenhouse, a white guy, a white kid actually. But in this case, well, we just don't know. The Muslim terrorist said he didn't like the Jews and the Muslim terrorist who was trying to free said she didn't like the Jews. And then they took a bunch of Jews out, but we don't, mm. if only we had more information. When facts go along with the liberal narrative, they are promoted. When facts can plausibly be contorted, and exaggerated and changed outright even to go along with the liberal narrative, they are promoted. Such as Kyle Kyle Rittenhouse was present at a BLM rally, riot, I suppose, and was chased away by people and then he fired back in self-defense. Okay, we can maybe we can get away with calling him a racist. That's, That's how that works. When facts contradict the liberal narrative, even when they are demonstrable facts. You got it in writing. You got them dead to rights. It's much more frequent that that happens. Those facts are suppressed. That's how it works. Any even hint of a fact 
or the semblance of a fact that can justify the liberal narrative. You're going to see it on CNN, MSNBC, New York Times, Washington Post. It's going to be everywhere. The president of the United States is going to be promoting it. If a terror attack occurs that contradicts the liberal narrative, it's just going to nothing to see here. Move along, move along, move along. And here's the argument, by the way. The argument is, yes, there are a lot of Muslim terror attacks. Yes, this is a big problem in America and on American interests abroad. But, but if we admit that, and it's, it's, um, in this case, we're talking about Muslim terror attacks, but this is true of other issues as well in society, having nothing to do with Muslims or terrorism. The argument is if we accept and admit certain facts, then Americans will turn into a savage band of animals murderous animals into lynch mobs that will just go around and kill innocent people who happen to have the same race or religion or geography or what have you. So we have to suppress the facts so that those animal Americans don't turn into a roving band of lynch mobs. Here is what Wajahat Ali, who is a liberal journalist from the Daily Beast, he tweeted out right away, right after the event. I, I actually think the terror attack may have still been going on. He tweeted out the important lesson. He said, you're about to hear some ugly and vicious Islamophobia and anti-Muslim bigotry this weekend from elected officials, commentators, and even mainstream media. Hope I'm wrong. People will use it to divide Jewish and Muslim communities for the political agenda. Don't fall for it. This is a man who, if you just, if you just search on Twitter, Wajahat Ali Christian, you will see rank, disgusting anti-Christian bigotry. Christianity, the most persecuted religion in the world, but per a study from Pew Research Center and per common sense and per historical understanding of the last 2,000 years. You will see hideous bigotry against white guys. You'll hear it's white Christian nationalism, white Christian supremacy. He says, we've got to get, get rid of it. from. We've got to completely blot it out from the country. These white Christians, they're such a big problem. Because if we don't, you're going to see the Islamophobia. You're going to see all the terrible oppression of this one group, the only group that it is legal to discriminate against and that it is socially encouraged to discriminate against. It's the opposite of what we're told is the case. The absolute opposite. Got to clean it up. Got to clean up society from all this nastiness, all this bigotry. When I want to clean my house, I turn to naturally, it's clean. If you've been in the store recently, any store, you'll notice that the cost of everything is going through the roof. I've noticed this especially when I go to the grocery store or the drug store and I want to buy cleaning supplies. Well, we have a solution for you and it's a really phenomenal solution. Our partner, Naturally It's Clean. Naturally It's Clean is the best cleaning supply I have ever used. I love it. It's amazing. Their secret is plant-based enzymes. So it's natural. It's, it's not going to you know, fill your house with toxins or anything like that. It's natural. It's, it's totally safe. It's good for kids. It's good for pets, but it's really going to work. It's going to get your home really, really clean, whether that's carpet, whether that's for countertops, whatever. And it's going to really help save you a lot of time and money, not only because they've got these great cleaning supplies at a very fair price, but because they will use concentrates. So one bottle of their concentrate can, can give you up to 12 bottles of cleaning supplies. It's really good for the environment. It's really good for your pocketbook. And it's really, really good to help clean your home. Try them right now. My listeners can get their hands on the Naturally It's Clean Daily Wire Essential Kit. That is stocked with four great products for 15% off. Visit naturallyitsclean.com slash Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L. Use promo code Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, to save an additional 15% off your order. Do not delay. A break from Biden inflation is here. Try out these incredible cleaning products in your home today by visiting naturallyitsclean.com slash Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, for more information. We'll move on to the, the political significance of this beyond just the attack on, on the synagogue in Texas. But what it shows, you, what the reaction of the media show you is that their narrative is the opposite of true, <laughs> right? Their, their narrative is that Muslims are being attacked all over the country. Muslims can't go, black people are being attacked all over the country. LeBron James said a black man can't walk outside his door without being hunted down by a racist cop. The argument is that uh, women and people of uh, aberrant sexual desires and all, sort, all these sorts of victim groups, they are really under attack in America. They're so put upon, they're so persecuted. 
But what the reaction tells you is it's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. There's only one race that it is legal to discriminate against. Sort of with a slight exception because the Asians also get it too. (laughs) In affirmative action in uh, college admissions. But otherwise, it's white people. You're told that if you're white, you get a privilege. But actually, you're at a disadvantage when you're applying to jobs and when you're applying to college. There's only one religion that it is socially acceptable and politically and legally even practicable to discriminate against. What's that? Christianity. It's the only one that it's socially accept- There are attacks on the Jews. There are attacks on Muslims. But those are always roundly condemned by all of our political leaders, by all, every branch of society. The only group that it is socially acceptable and often encouraged to mock, to insult, and to persecute Christians. It's the only one in the West. The only sex that you're allowed to criticize and attack and insult socially. What is it? It's men who allegedly have all the privilege. The reality is the opposite of what we're being told. Now, speaking of the Jews, there is a gubernatorial candidate in Florida named Nikki Freed. She's the Democrat who's going up against Ron DeSantis for governor. Nikki Freed has an interesting theory that pertains to the Jews and political persecution. And her theory is that Ron DeSantis is a lot like Hitler. He is doing everything possible to take away power from local governments, taking away people's abilities to protest, making it harder to vote, talking about, you know, banning books. Um, That's what dictators do. Um, Instead of listening and trying to govern with the people, he's trying to govern over the people. And, you know, that I'm sorry. You know, I am a student of history, too. I saw the rise of Hitler. I I learned of those stories. Are you comparing DeSantis to Hitler? In a lot of ways, yes. I have studied Hitler and how he got to power, you know, wanting his own militia uh, and and having his own. There are other states that have one. Absolutely. But the reason why this governor wants it is different than the other states that have been utilizing it for emergency purposes. This governor is doing it for the sole purposes of power and in doing so to make fear and to instill that, to blame people for what is happening in their lives, blaming certain parts of our society and our culture. And, and that's exactly what, what Hitler did uh, to the Jews back you know, during um, World War II. I'm no PhD in history, okay? I'm not an academic historian. But I don't think that's exactly what Hitler did to the Jews back during World War II. I, correct me if I'm wrong, if you're out there and you, you have more expertise on this. Uh, I don't think that the DeSantis policies in Florida, you know, change the curricula a little bit, reform the curricula, keep some businesses open, maybe don't, don't allow the mask mandates. I don't think that's exactly the same thing as what Hitler did to the Jews in World War II. I don't know. I just think there might be some differences, I guess is what I'm saying. Obviously, this woman is not very intelligent, Nikki Fried, and is not particularly educated. And she is doing what the entire left and many people on the right do, which is compare everyone they don't like to Hitler. Because Hitler is the only historical figure that they even think they know anything about. And they probably don't even know very much about World War II or or the 20th century or dictatorship in, in the past century. But it's the one that they think they know something about. Hitler and occasionally they'll reference the fall of Rome. There are more historical events. Uh, Most people are not like Hitler. Usually Hitler comparisons are not particularly illuminating. And it shows something else as well, which is that no one ever says "This, this candidate is so bad, he's just like Stalin. This candidate is so bad, he's just like Mao. This, this candidate, this politician is so bad, he's a lot like Che Guevara. He's a lot like Fidel Castro. Very rarely do you hear those comparisons. You only hear people disparagingly compared to bad political figures who can plausibly be lumped onto the right, even though obviously it's more complicated with the Nazi party because it has elements of the right, but it's also got elements of leftism and it's very modern. And anyway, you could go on for hours about that. But you you never hear the comparisons made disparagingly to politicians and dictators and tyrants who are firmly on the left because because the liberals won. They won. They've won our politics. They rule the country. The conservatives have 
some modicum of dissent and some slight ability to push back a little bit, but we are clearly the junior partner in the way that this country is ruled. And so all bad things have to be on the right. And no really, really bad things are ever on the left. That's way, that's, that's the way that that works. Now, there are, there, there is some hope here. There is some hope coming back, which is that we are winning some elections and Republicans are finally gaining a spine and, and courage. And they're pushing back on the liberal policies. Namely, Glenn Youngkin in Virginia. Glenn Youngkin, first day in office, he was just sworn in, first day in office, bans critical race theory in schools, bans mask mandates in schools, and his attorney general fired, I think, 30 some odd officials in that office and is now prom- very liberal officials who weren't prosecuting crime. And he is now promising to prosecute the criminals who the local George Soros funded DAs are going to let off the hook. This is good. This is really good news from Glenn Youngkin. This is the future of the conservative movement and the Republican party. It is good in and of itself that Youngkin is doing these things, but it's also a sign of what people want. It's also a sign of where the political winds are shifting. Do not forget, Glenn Youngkin first ran for governor as a standard issue, run-of-the-mill business Republican who promised to cut your taxes and leave you alone. That was the early pitch for his campaign. His campaign only shifted in the final weeks to a culture warrior campaign that focused on critical race theory and transgenderism in schools and the gender neutral bathrooms. It became this very intense cultural conservative campaign only in the final weeks. And that's what pushed him over the finish line. What got him over the finish line was not a surge in Republican voter registration in, in Virginia, which is overwhelmingly Democrat. What pushed him over the finish line is parents, not parents who were concerned about their taxes primarily, parents who didn't want their kids to be raped in the school bathroom and didn't want their kids to be told that white people are evil because of the way they're born and kids to be told that little Johnny can become little Jill if he wants to and, and should be able to mutilate his bodies and pretend to be the other sex. That's what did it, culture. And Young can realize that he switched his campaign and he won. He won as a culture warrior. Now he is signaling that he's going to govern like Ron DeSantis. I wonder why. Maybe because Ron DeSantis is the most popular Republican governor in the country and is considered one of the leading presidential contenders in 2024. You think that might have something to do with it? I suspect it will. This actually, this is really good news for the conservative movement and really good news for the Republican Party, but it creates a problem for Ron DeSantis, which is right now, when you just look at the governors, Ron DeSantis is the only Ron DeSantis. He's the only Republican governor who is really out there in every single national news story, getting his name in it, on the right side of the issue, pushing back, leading the charge. As we get closer to 2024, I think you're going to see a lot of Ron DeSantis copycats. And Ron DeSantis deserves credit for being the first guy there. But when you're looking at 2024, what happens if you've got a field where all the governors are Ron DeSantis. The governors and the senators and the congressmen, other people are going to run too, but it's kind of comparing apples and oranges because they just do different things in government. But if you've got a field where all the governors are Ron DeSantis, that's a little tough then to distinguish yourself other than saying I was first. So they're going to have to all keep it up. They're going to have to go further. They're going to have to keep fighting. And this is, though I'm sorry for Governor DeSantis that it might make his campaign a little tougher, this is really great news for the conservative movement, the Republican Party, because now all of the political pressure is pushing these governors toward courage, toward the right, toward standing up for true substantive things and not just the same dumb Republican platitudes we've heard for 20 years. Really good news. Speaking of power politics, there was a movie that a lot of people were watching over the weekend and it was trending all around Twitter and things like that. This is The Tragedy of Macbeth. The Tragedy of Macbeth, it was a movie version based on Macbeth by Shakespeare, starring Denzel Washington and Francis McDormand. And it was slightly controversial because, as you might recognize, Denzel Washington is not a particularly well-known Scotsman, (laughs) and the play is about a Scottish king. Uh, But I decided I was going to sit down and was going to watch the movie. Joel Cohen one of the greatest living directors, Denzel Washington, one of the greatest living actors, Frances McDormand, one of the greatest living actresses, and Macbeth, one of the greatest plays ever written. You will be unsurprised to hear it was a very, very good movie. And I thought when I was 
watching this movie about an extremely corrupt political order that is based on treachery, sometimes outright murder, that rips the polity asunder and, and leads to horrible problems for the whole society, I thought, huh, this might have something to tell us about our country today. Hmm, maybe more people, should, maybe that's the reason they made the movie in the first place. Now, We'll get to more on that in one second. But speaking of movies, I'm very excited to announce the release of The Daily Wire's first original production. We released a movie that had already been made last year, and we bought the distribution rights because people were trying to cancel it. So that was our first movie. This is our first original movie. It's called Shut In. It is a seat-gripping thriller that will be available to stream in February. It follows the story of a young mother who's barricaded inside a closet by her violent ex-husband as she's trapped inside. She uses nothing but her voice to guide her children on the other side of the walls to safety, all while the threat of her dangerous ex looms. So go uh, check it out. It's really cool. Uh, We cannot wait to share the finished product with you. So make sure you catch the final trailer when it drops tomorrow. It's going to be a lot of fun. If you're planning on adding this terrifying thriller to your queue, you want us to keep making that content that the mainstream media do not want to produce, then go like and share the trailer on YouTube. Your support makes all the difference. Also, we're going to have backstage. Finally, again, DW is one of the first in the nation to file suit against the Biden administration on their unconstitutional OSHA vaccine mandate. Our case made it to the Supreme Court, and we won. Tune in tomorrow night to catch an all-new episode of Backstage where we discuss the outcome of that Supreme Court ruling. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to drink a lot of leftist tears. It's going to be me, Ben, Jeremy, Matt, and Drew, 7 p.m., 6 p.m. Central, dailywire.com, or you can stream it on our YouTube channel, Daily Wire. We'll be right back with a lot more. Welcome back to the show. I really loved this movie, The Tragedy of Macbeth. It's kind of an artsy film. It's black and white. It's an ambitious adaptation. It's minimalist in its set design, but it's it's artsy. So if you don't like artsy movies, this is not going to be the movie for you. But it is one of the greatest plays ever written by the greatest English playwright with some of the greatest living actors and actresses and the greatest director. So it's really wonderful. The one controversy of it was that Denzel Washington obviously is not Scottish. He's a black guy. So should a black guy be allowed to play a white part? And is this woke? And is this politically correct? The debate over colorblind casting is an extremely complicated one. It's, it's not a simple answer one way or the other folks. This has been a debate that's gone on for decades. One of the great proponents of colorblind casting was a guy named Bob, is a guy named Bob Brustein, who was the founder of the El Repertory Theater and uh, is a sort of legend in the theater world. He, he's a white guy. He's a big proponent of colorblind casting, having black people play white parts and not taking into account a, an actor's ethnicity. August Wilson, who's probably the most famous black playwright of the last hundred years, maybe the most famous black playwright in American history, he hated colorblind casting. He said black people should not play white parts. White people should not play black parts. This is insane. Race involves lots of cultural aspects, and it's you can't suspend disbelief and you shouldn't do it. There is also this double standard now, which is that white actors not, white actors are not allowed to play any non-white parts. And if they are, there's a big uproar and the woke people scream about it. White actors are not even allowed to voice non-white parts. <laughs> the white actor who voiced Apu on The Simpsons got, got canceled from the part because you're not allowed to do that anymore. So yes, there's a double standard. It's, it's preposterous. It's silly. However, if you can get past all of the stupid woke stuff, and just recognize that Denzel Washington is one of the greatest living actors and his performance in this movie is just incredible, then I think you can tune out all of the noise. Furthermore, you can say that Shakespeare is writing about not specific issues only related to Scotland, but he's writing about the human condition. And therefore, it makes a lot more sense for a black guy to play that role. Even though it's a Scottish role, really the play is about the human condition. Whereas if you had Denzel Washington starring in the the remake of The Sopranos, that probably wouldn't make a lot of sense, would it? The Sopranos is very specifically about an Italian-American family, so it wouldn't make sense to have a non-Italian actor play that part. Okay, that's a little bit of the controversy around it. The reason I even bring up the movie, though, is because the play is about fate versus free will. 
in the movie, Joel Cohen really brings this out. Macbeth opens up the play. One of the very first scenes of the play, he's walking up and he sees a a bunch of witches and the witches tell him his future and they say, you're going to become king, but you're not going to have a line of kings and tells his partner Banquo, you're not going to be king, but your kids are going to become king. And this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And Macbeth is struck with this and he says, well, hold on. If all of this is going to, first of all, do I believe these witches that that's really going to happen? And then he sees some proof that some of their predictions came true. And he says, well, okay, if it's going to happen, then I guess I don't need to do anything. He says, if chance will have me king, why chance may crown me without my stir? I'm not going to do anything about it. But then he does do something about it. He says, and it, mostly because his, his wife, Lady Macbeth, is just an early version of Hillary Clinton. And she's this sort of wicked political character who just it impels him and convinces him to kill the king and become king himself. And so he does participate in it. But was that always fated or did he really have free choice? And by the end, he and his Hillary Clinton wife go completely insane. And he's, he's, she becomes extremely depressed. He becomes very depressed. He can't sleep anymore because he killed the king in his sleep. He says, he says sleep no more. Macbeth does murder sleep. I'll never sleep again because, one, he saw the king die in his sleep, and two, because he's, he's racked by the moral reality of what he's done. He's, it, one of the most famous lines of the entire place is, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time, and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That's what a lot of people think life is today. That's what pe- they think that it's all just kind of a joke. It's all just kind of a farce, a tale told by an idiot signifying nothing. Our hopes, our dreams, our loves, our joys. It's all just an illusion, man. You know, it's just chemicals firing off in our brain. And it's just, and it, by the way, if you, if you don't like how you're feeling, just take a pill and then you'll feel better. Or just do, do some other drugs or just go have sex with somebody or go some, you know, sort of casual sex or just go have a drink or just go play video games or just plug into the metaverse or just, just give yourself pleasure because that's all it is. It doesn't mean anything. But what Macbeth and his wife realize after they've committed this horrible sin is that the sin really does mean something. Another one of the most famous lines is you've got Hillary Clinton there, Lady Macbeth, and she's saying, out damned spot. Out, she's trying to rub out the rub out the blood, rub out what she's done, but she can't. She can't forget it. Macbeth can't sleep because he can't forget what he actually did because it does signify something. It does. Life actually does matter. The things we do, there is a moral universe, and we're living in an age where we try to blot all that out and we say that everything is just about power. Right? The left says that politics is just different interest groups. And usually they push interest groups on racial or sexual lines. It's just them vying for power. And there's no sense and there's no order and there's no truth and there's no justice and there's no goodness. It's just interest and power. And frankly, you have people on the right saying almost the same thing. It's amazing that it's the conservatives who for the past 30 years have said all life is about is money and just boosting GDP and cutting taxes. And you do you. And we're not going to legislate morality. And don't yuck my yum. And who's to say what's good? I mean, they, they sound just like the liberals. And they all sound like Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, and that's why we live in a crappy country right now, (laughs) because we need to recognize that life actually does signify something. That's how we will have better sleep. That is how we will have a better country. That is how we will rub out that damn spot, is by recognizing that there's a moral order, there is sin, there is grace, there is truth, there is falsehood, there is goodness, there is evil, and there is redemption if only we seek it. Speaking of madness, speaking of madness, there's a viral video going around of a gal who is going to transition. She's going to have the gender surgery. She's a woman now, but she's going to make herself look more like a man because she says that the men who are living in her brain want that. So she doesn't want that. She, the woman, but the men living in her brain do want her to do that. And so that's what they are going to do. So I'm a member of a DID system, and for me right now, that means that in the coming months, I am going to be able to watch some of my best friends and some of my closest companions get the body of their dreams that matches their gender, that makes them feel happy, and in exchange, I'm going to have to give up my own. I'm cisgender, the majority of my headmates aren't, and we've decided to transition. Which means that as happy as I am for the men in my system, I am about to have to watch myself go through the wrong puberty. Uh, <laughs> and it's going to be permanent! 
I don't think we talk enough about how DID gets rid of a person's bodily autonomy. You know, I hear people say all the time, the one thing you have control over is your own body and your own reactions, and I don't have that. This isn't my body, these aren't my reactions or my memories. I have like 30 people living in my brain and everything I do belongs to us as a group. That's what's so hellish about this disorder. My parents f***ing up, and now I will never have full bodily autonomy. Anyways, um, everybody say congratulations to the men in my system, because they get to transition, and we're happy for them. So this woman, and I say this with as much sympathy as there is in the world, is completely insane. And she is acknowledging that. She's saying, I have this, this med- mental condition called DID. I googled DID. DID is a dissociative identity disorder. So multiple personalities all floating around in her imagination. And she says that a lot of them are men, and the men want her to mutilate her body. In the olden days, this, this was attributed to more spiritual causes. You might recall reading in the Bible when you go up to someone and they start speaking with multiple personalities and they say, we are legion, and this was considered not a very good thing and something to be fixed rather than indulge. Today, we indulge it. And so this woman says, I've got 10 different men living in my brain, and therefore I'm transgender, and we're going to change my body. When she goes to the doctor and says, I've got 10 men living in my brain. The doctor says, okay, well, you've got this disorder, dissociative identity disorder, and we're going to treat that disorder. She says, okay, and I'm transgender. I'm really a man. And the doctor says, oh, well, okay, let's chop you up then. Why? Why are we acknowledging that one of these mental illnesses is a mental illness, and why are we pretending that the other one is perfectly normal and and just an ordinary aspect of one's identity? If, if a, a single person walks up and says, I'm actually 10 people, we igno- for now at least, we acknowledge that that's not true and crazy and you should treat that. But if a woman walks up and says, I'm actually a man, we, until three or four years ago, we would say, no, that's not true, that's crazy, and we would try to treat that. Now we just say, okay, buddy, let's go hunting. Let's, go, let's, let's do it, pal. You want to go play a round of golf? doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to me. Why is one of these crazy and the other one legitimate? They were both in the DSM. They were both in the the catalog of mental illnesses until very recently. How come one of them got taken out? Because transgenderism is ideologically and politically convenient for the left in this country. And so we're turning something that is manifestly a disorder into a political tool. Fairly disturbing. Speaking of disturbing videos going around to the internet. There's a, an even more disturbing one, if you can believe it, than, than the woman with multiple demonic figures in her head. That would be a kid who was on TikTok with his mother and said that his mother is going to make him join the LGBTQ community. Does your mom say you have to be LGBT? Um, no. no, I think she's what I want to be, but some, t- but... On. Go ahead, Lex. Go ahead. Keep talking. Say what you're saying. Um, my mom doesn't matter if I'm up, if I am gay or lesbian or any of that. She doesn't care. All she cares about is that I'm a part of it. And if I'm not a part of it, she'll try to convince me to uh, um, get, join it. Because I... What? Are you saying right now? Facts. That I would convince you to join what? The LGBTQIA+. This is bad. Obviously, we're blurring the kids' faces, unlike this abusive mother who's putting her kids on the internet for her own edification and pleasure and gain. Uh, But you you can see when the kid starts to answer this question, the other kid looks at the mother and says, ooh, and the other kid, he puts his hand and he says, don't, maybe don't answer that. And the kid says, no, it's okay. It's just my mom, she doesn't care if I'm a lesbian or gay or transgender or whatever. She just wants me to be one of them. I've just got to be part of it. I've just got to be in some way part of the LGBT community. And then the mother says, huh, wait, hold on. She realizes this answer is not going the way she wanted it to when she put her kids on screen. And she, she says, what are you talking about? What are you saying? And he says, facts. Obviously, you want me to do that. And so this was put out by Libs of TikTok, which is now reporting that the mother is apparently quite involved in the LGBTQ community and has some kind of romantic relationship with some kind of transgender type. So she's obviously promoting this sort of stuff. People are shocked 
that, that the kid would say this. People are shocked that a mother would do Of course, I'm not shocked at all. Being in the LGBT LMNOP community carries social currency. I know that the <laughs> liberal establishment pretends that to be in the LGBT LMNOP comes with lots of sacrifice and, and terrible burdens and that it's, you're actually a persecuted minority, but that's not the case. Every power center in this country promotes LGBTQ. If you disparage LGBTQ, even the crazy, even the, even the T, which is the craziest part of all, if you disparage that, you will be censored often. You will be deplatformed often. You could face professional repercussions. You could be fired. You could be kicked out of school. Depending on exactly how you do it, you might face some criminal penalties. You can't do that. You're not allowed. It's one of the most protected groups in the country. Actually, the only group that you are allowed to discriminate against legally, the only group, uh, sexual group that you're allowed to and encouraged to publicly insult and attack is what? It's straight people. That's it. It's the opposite of what the libs are telling us. They, it's on race, on sex, on religion, on the entire political order. All of the powerful institutions are telling you this group is really persecuted and this group is doing the persecuting. And so, well, what's the effect of that? The effect of that is when all of the power centers are smearing one group and are lauding another group and protecting another group and giving advantage to another group, then, then the groups are actually flipped. <laughs> then the one that we're told is persecuted is not. It's powerful. And the one that we're told is powerful is actually persecuted. That's the way these things work. Speaking of bad moms, the New York Times has another distressing story. This also, this really also kind of comes back to Macbeth, to our Macbeth culture, to Lady Macbeth in particular. The New York Times is defending moms abandoning their kids. This is from the culture section. So they're talking about all these new movies where moms are just leaving their kids and all these new stories and books where moms abandon their kids. They, they write, the mother who abandons her children haunts our family narratives. She's made into a lurid tabloid figure, an exotic exception to the common deadbeat father, or she is sketched into the background of a plot her absence lending a protagonist a propulsive origin story. This figure arouses our ridicule. Ridicule. Consider Meryl Streep's daffy American president in Don't Look Up, who forgets to save her son as she flees the apocalypse. Or our pity. See Parallel Mothers, where an actress has ditched her daughter for lousy television parts. But lately, the vanishing mother has provoked a fresh response. Respect. Because they say the one thing a mother cannot do in our culture, the one thing she cannot do, the thing that is so taboo it rivals actually murdering her offspring, is leave. Now, the argument doesn't seem to make a lot of sense because they're, they're referencing movies that still look on the mother abandoning her children with scorn and pity, like Meryl Streep's movie where she abandons her son. Meryl Streep is not exactly a sympathetic figure in Don't Look Up, which I did a review of, by the way, that you can catch on YouTube. But why is this? Why is it that mothers abandoning their children arouses our scorn and our pity and our heartbreak is it just our prejudice? Is it just our sexism? Or is it that mothers abandoning their children horrifies us because it is horrifying? Is it different when a mother abandons her kid than when you have a deadbeat dad? Who also, deadbeat dads are also looked on with scorn and disdain and pity. And so, but, but it's different. I grant you it's different. Is it that Mothers who abandon their kids are looked on as different than dads who abandon their kids because moms and dads are different. Yeah, that's how human beings have understood moms and dads for all of recorded history everywhere in the world until five minutes ago because now we have to pretend that moms and dads are exactly the same. We're doing my show from home right now because global warming reared its ugly head in Nashville and so the whole city is covered in ice and because Nashville is not accustomed to snow and doesn't know how to deal with it, a little bit of ice means we do our shows from home. Okay, so I've got my wife and my child outside of my office here. I play around with my kid. I go see the kid during the day. You know, I want to Gucci goo him and he, he likes it. It's full play for a little bit. 
But you know what he likes more than hanging out with dad? He likes hanging out with mommy. And when he is just sort of sitting, playing, having fun, then he'll play with dad. But when he really wants something, when he's in distress, when he's hungry, when he's tired, when, he's, when he just wants comfort, do you know where he turns? He doesn't turn to daddy. He turns to mommy. Because mommy and daddy are different. We're physically different. We're different in our relation to the baby. We're different spiritually, metaphysically, emotionally. We're just different, okay? But since the sexual revolution, we've had to pretend that men and women are exactly the same. You saw this first with the second wave feminists who said a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle, said all of the virtues now are masculine virtues, all of the feminine virtues are trash, so women have to go work in the widget factory just like men, and any woman who wants to stay home should not be allowed to do it. That's what Simone de Beauvoir, one of the most prominent feminists of that era, said. She said women can't even be given that choice because too often they'll take it and then they won't be liberated. So it starts with the second wave feminists, it moves on to the gay rights movement, which says that men and women are exactly the same, and once we accepted, once we accepted that premise, then almost inevitably you were going to redefine marriage because if men and women are exactly the same, then the union of one man and one woman is exactly the same as the union of one man and one man. It's exactly the same as the union between one woman and one woman. But once you accept that, then you've got to accept transgenderism. Because if men and women are exactly the same, then there's no reason that a man can't become a woman and a woman can't become a man. Women tried to transform themselves into men in the 1970s. They did it without the surgeries, usually, but they certainly did it socially. They certainly did it emotionally, they tried at least. And so when you've got the technology to chop people up and make them look a little bit more like the other sex, why would you not do that too? And now you've got the culture lauding mothers who abandon their kids. Because why? Because men and women are exactly the same. They, I don't think they would laud fathers who abandon their kids, by the way, but they would laud mothers for doing that. Also because the, the power and the privilege are not exactly what the liberal establishment tells us. But this is evidence that something has gone horrifically wrong in society. And it's a consequence of sexual confusion, and it's a consequence, by the way, of an obsession with individualism that does not merely exist on the, right, on the left. It exists on the right as well. You see it on the left where they say that anyone's individual appetites, especially sexual appetites, but others as well for drugs and food and, and all sorts of things, should be indulged and none of them are wrong. This is why you see the movement for fat positivity and sex positivity and all the rest of it drug legalization. And you see it on the right as well. You see it on the right with money. You see it on the right, even with certain kinds of behavior. You leave me alone. You, li- you, know, you do you. If it doesn't affect me, if it doesn't scare the horses in the street, then you can do whatever you want. That's not my business. Just cut taxes and, and do whatever you want behind closed doors. None of that is conservative. None of that is conducive to a good polity. It's just not going to work. Now, speaking of scientific reality, I've got to get to one story because I think it's so important that we all rally the troops here. Joe Rogan is under fire. They are trying, the libs are trying to cancel Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is under fire because he is giving a platform to scientists who dissent from the liberal establishment. People like Robert Malone, Dr. Robert Malone, who helped to develop mRNA technology, who's now skeptical of the vaccines. So anyway, there is now a, a petition an open letter from 300 scientists telling Spotify to get rid of Joe Rogan. So we took a little look into these 300 scientists. It's a great, uh, Luke Rudkowski posted some of them. Let's see, we've got uh, the director of research at Grasshopper Farms, Cole Creighton. We've got Colleen Tricarton Frost. She's a dentist. We've got Courtney Kennedy, a physician's assistant. We've got Crystal Paula, a nurse practitioner. We've got uh, uh, Daniel Jones, a consultant. We've got uh, uh, Daniel Levitt, a postdoc. So these aren't, these aren't exactly specialists. They're not exactly the top scientists in their field. Some of them are dentists. They'll say, Joe Rogan's not a scientist. Sure, but the scientists that he interviews are. The problem is, because they dissent from the liberal establishment, they are, they're unpersoned. They're, not, they're no longer scientists. Joe Rogan is far right now. Joe Rogan is on the left, but Joe Rogan is far right now. People like Glenn Greenwald, far right now. They're all, anyone who, it, far right doesn't mean you're on the right wing. It doesn't mean you're conservative. It doesn't mean, it just means you dissent from the established liberal orthodoxy, which is presenting to you a reality that is completely different from the way things actually are. 
And people, they see it when the FBI comes out and says the Muslim terror is screaming about Jews, we don't know his motive. You can see it when Dr. Fauci admits that he was lying about some aspect of COVID or the, the, or the whole public health establishment changes. You can see it, but then we keep going on. We just keep going on. And I think people are waking up a little bit to that delusion. But there is no way that we are going to have a good society, that we're going to have a flourishing, a free, and equitable, a just society, if we continue to indulge delusions, whether they're at the national level or whether they're at the personal level of pretending that men are women. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. See you tomorrow. The Michael Knowles Show is produced by Ben Davies. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our technical director is Austin Stevens. Supervising producer, Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Vidovsky. Editor and associate producer, Danny D'Amico. Associate producer, Justine Turley. Audio mixer, Mike Coromina. And hair and makeup by Cherokee Hart. The Michael Knowles Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022. John Bickley here, Daily Wire editor-in-chief. Wake up every morning with our show, Morning Wire. On today's episode, inflation reaches record levels, the Biden administration faces tough questions on their immigration policies, and how Omicron changes the COVID game. Join us and get the facts first on the news you need to know with our show, Morning Wire. Morning Wire.